So you've got Old Testament history um, leading up to the crucifixion, and then that starts New Testament history, which of course the dominant world power during the New Testament was the Roman Empire for a long time. Okay. So, any questions about page one? No. Okay. So, we're going to zoom in. Now, if you're confused by page two, it looks like a bunch of weird shapes and words. Go back and try to understand how it fits into page one. It should say, okay, we just basically are cutting off the Old Testament and looking forward into church history all the way up until the year uh, 1453, which you don't need to remember that, but that's just that's just when the... What was the significance of 1453? Well, that is when the Byzantine Empire ended. By the way, if you would have gone back and asked someone in the Byzantine Empire what empire is this, they would have said, this is the Roman Empire. I'm a Roman. We call the Byzantine Empire, um, just to distinguish it, for our sakes, but they didn't. How was it different? Well, it was just the uh, eastern half of the Roman Empire. So look at uh, the big chart, uh, the big shape there, and, and don't think about the colors. Pretend like that's all the same color. That's what the Roman Empire looked like. Um, it was one big thing, and then the western half fell, and then the eastern half continued another thousand years. Islam. Until it fell to Islam. Yeah, the, the Ottoman Empire took it over in 1453. So, that block, don't worry about the, the difference between the colors yet, but that block is the Roman Empire. It lasted, as an empire, it lasted um, 1,400 years. Before it was an empire, it was a republic. And that was another 700 years. So it's the biggest political, ent political entity in history. Okay, so now, going back to the black part of it, um, and can anyone guess what the cross and the fire represents? Just raise your hand if you think you know, but don't say. It would be a persecution. Yeah. Okay, Same. yeah. Same. Persecution of Christians. Now, I have it in three little areas because there was no... Um, there was no, like, big empire-wide persec persecution of Christians except for a few little areas. It was sporadic. It wasn't like the Roman Empire constantly persecuted Christians. Um, there was sporadic persecution here and there when an empire, an emperor who really hated Christians uh, would come into power. Now, the in-between times when there was no official persecution of Christians, there certainly may have been little instances here and there like we're seeing in America. We're seeing little instances, you know, I got made fun of on the playground as a, for being a Christian at a public school, little things like that. Um, but, um, yeah, as far as big empire-wide persecution, it was just here and there. Now, um, when a great wave of Christian persecution, the last one there, um, was happening, Constantine the Great came to power and he issues, issues the Edict of Milan. What do you think that did based on the chart? Just based on the way I arranged things on the chart. Just guess. It ended persecution. It ended persecution. Yes, it made it illegal to persecute Christians. Okay, shortly thereafter, there was another very important edict by this guy Constantine um, called the Edict of Thessalonica. Now, based on the colors of the chart, what do you think, don't look ahead, cheaters, 
I see that. <laughs> Based on the colors of the chart, what do you think that edict did? Anyone want to take a guess? I know I haven't said what the colors represent, but I'm just wondering if anyone can guess. Establish the church, the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, it made Christianity the official religion of the whole Roman Empire. So the that's part why. Of it, the part of it. That's why I changed the colors, because for the first roughly 380 years, the Roman Empire was pagan, meaning they worshipped Jupiter and Juno and all those Roman gods. Um, all, all different gods. And then in 380, officially, it became a Christian empire. Now, I'm sure there were still people who worshipped their little you know, local god and secretly, and I'm sure there were pe many people who were like, okay, whatever, we're Christians now. I still don't believe in Jesus, but yeah, sure. Because I have to be, you know, or I'm breaking the law. But officially, that's when the Roman Empire became a Christian empire. So that's very important um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm sure many Christians were happy that the persecution ended. And I bet a lot of Christians were super happy when Christianity became the official religion. They thought, this is great. I bet there would be a lot of American Christians who would be happy if a president or a Congress said, this is a Christian nation, you must be a Christian in America. Boom. They would be happy at first. But when they started to think about it, they would realize, wait a minute. Now everyone I ask, Do you, are you a Christian? Do you believe in the gospel? Everybody would say yes even if they're not Christians. It makes witnessing a lot harder. It just it makes things very confusing because everyone on paper is a Christian. But that's what happened. Whether we like it or not, that's what happened. Okay, now, while that was going on, underneath that you can see, you know, Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, ascended, um, missionary journeys happening by Paul and many others. New Testament books are being written. The Apostolic Fathers are writing thanks. We talked about that last week. We focused on Polycarp. Anybody remember any factoid about Polycarp? It's okay if you don't. Yes, yes. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. Um, so that's, um, that's important. Okay, but within one generation, the Apostolic Fathers, there was nobody left who knew the Apostles personally. So after that period, we call it the Church Fathers' writings. And depending on who you talk to, most people would say that era ended in 750, the Church Fathers. Okay, and so I have just some... There's many more, but I just picked some important church fathers to give you a general idea of where they were. Um, so we've got Polycarp, Tertullian, Ambrose, John, Chrysostom, Jerome, Augustine, and Gregory I. Now, I've given you two page threes so that you can tear it out. And I left lots of room in case you tear poorly. You can tear out the first page three and you can put it so that you can look at both. That's the goal here that you can see both pages, two and three. Because what I've done is I've taken those guys listed at the bottom of page three and we're going to just talk about a, just a few little details about them, none of which you need to remember. You do not need to remember any of the details, but I think I carefully, carefully planned uh, a goal for not, not the details, but looking at each of the details, I think will help you. Now, 
If you're getting bogged down in the details on page three as we go through it, just remember there's a point to it that we're going to come to later. Okay. So is anyone confused about why we're looking at two different pages? We're looking at page two and page three. Okay. So Constantine the Great in 380. He's above the two line, the double blue lines on page three because he's up at the top of page two. And he's not a church father. He's a Roman emperor. Probably the second greatest. It was uh, Caesar Augustus, by far the greatest emperor. Without his administration skills, it would not have lasted the way it did. Uh, but then, as it was crumbling, Constantine the Great came along and single-handedly saved, as a political entity, saved the Roman Empire. Could be some people who disagree with that, but... Um, now, whether or not he was actually a Christian is highly suspect. He may have been, he may not have been, but he knew that this was going to be good for the Empire. It was something to unify uh, a whole bunch of separate people groups. I mean, when the, mil the Roman military was at its height, it was just the threat of death that unified them. But as it was falling apart, now he found a religion that could unify them. So, he ended persecution. We already talked about that. He made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's the blank there by him. Okay, so he's the em emperor that we need, needed to mention. And now we're going to go through a bunch of church fathers who were highly significant. And we're just going to say one fact about each one. Um, now, I happen to pick uh, most of them from the same couple centuries. That's, that's okay. I covered all the centuries at the bottom. But anyway, let's look at Basil the Great. Okay. He explained the basis of, uh, for the deity of, anyone want to guess? Um, of the Holy Spirit, actually. There were people who, and you could see how if you had never heard any sermons or anything, and you read the New Testament, you might come away thinking the Holy Spirit was just something else. Because there's not a ton of verses uh, explaining his deity. But there's, there's plenty, but not just not as many as Jesus. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, or HS, you can put if you want. Okay, so that's kind of significant. Because there's lots of people saying, no, no, the Holy Spirit was like just God, just God's influence. Wasn't even a person. Um, so Basil the Great really uh, explained that for Christians. Uh, then in the year 400, this guy, uh, John Chrysostom, comes along and he emphasized plain, plain meaning over allegorical. Plain like P O A I N? Yeah. P L A I N. Uh, very important because when you read those old writings, uh, you can say a lot of them had some pretty far-fetched interpretations. Um, it doesn't mean they didn't; they were not born again. It doesn't mean they were bad people. Um, but I remember reading someone. Uh, who said um, the in Song of Solomon the kiss because there's you know Song of Solomon about marriage and all those things it mentions a kiss his kisses are um, sweeter than wine or something like that he said a kiss has two lips involved and the two lips of the kiss represent God's love for you and God's salvation of you or something like that. And you're like, okay, I maybe, but how are you possibly getting that from the scriptures? 
Where are you just because I because I can make up anything? Maybe it represents God the Father and God the Son, and the action of the kiss represents the Holy Spirit. You could say anything you want. Okay, so so then this guy comes along and says, now "Hang on, the Bible means what it says. There's no." Secret meaning underneath, hidden, that only a really smart person could figure out. So that was very important. Um, and it doesn't mean there's zero allegory in the Bible. It doesn't mean there's no metaphors. <clears throat> Obviously, when Jesus says, I am the gate, that's a metaphor. Right? He's not physically a gate with a latch on his tongue. That's an obvious one. I use that one a lot because nobody walks away from reading John 10 and thinks, I guess Jesus is not a person. He's a gate. Right? You'd have to be... Anyone uh, who's just a normal person realizes that one. Okay. So, but generally speaking, the Bible means what it says. Um, okay. Then Jerome comes along. And uh, he did more than just this, but this is one very important thing he did, is that he translated the Bible into Latin. Now, for those of you who had some experience with the Bible being read in Latin in church and you getting zero out of it because you don't understand Latin, you may think that was a bad thing. But can you figure out why it was a really, really good thing? Sound literacy. Okay, good. Um, so can anyone tell me what category these languages are in? Spanish, Italian, French. Yeah, yeah, we call those, um, even Romanian, we call those Romance languages because they come from the Roman language, which is Latin. Even most of English. 70% uh, of English comes from Latin. So, people were speaking Latin all over the known world. And so with the Bible now in Latin, that's a great thing for most people. They can, they can read it for themselves. Because most people had for, had, didn't know Greek or Hebrew. <clears throat> so Jerome did a great thing, getting it into the language of the people. Unfortunately, as language changed, then it needed to be translated again into the language of the people. Okay, so that's Jerome in 400. Okay, in 410. Now, I could have put 400 because Augustine was alive and writing in, in uh, 400. But I put 410 because that's the year that the city of Rome was sacked, fell. It fell to enemies, invaders. And people were mentally devastated by that. Try to imagine our great American emperor, empire, try to imagine like New York and Washington, D.C., that whole, it's actually one big um, urban area from New York to D.C., it includes Philly, and um, uh, that whole region, if that all fell and some other nation owned it. And so, the rest of the country was like, whoa, okay. Um, so I guess if you live somewhere else, we're all still the same thing. We're going to have to come up with a new capital or something. This is really going to cause problems for our country. Um, so in 410, Rome fell and people were like, what? Rome fell? Okay, that was... that's. What does this mean? Are we still part of the Roman Empire? What, what's going on? So in that year, in the years following, Augustine, he was, the blank there is, he was a writer, and he refuted heresies. He wrote a book called The City of God mm -hmm. um, to say, to explain to people, there's no earthly city that you need the only, truly, the only true city you need is the city of God. And it said a lot of other things. It was a big, big book. But um, a very important work. Okay? Then we got 
one more guy, basically, and that's Gregory I in the year 600. He sent missionaries and founded the church in, where do you think? Rome. Not Rome. Asia. Not Asia. Very good guesses. Um, Ephesus. No? In the year 600, he founded the church in England. Because most of England was part of the Roman Empire. They conquered most of the islands, and when they got up to the north, and they couldn't conquer the rest, they just built a big wall. And they said, that's off the edge of the map. Um, so, but there was all these pagans living up in the, that big island, and it was part of the Roman Empire, so, Greg, uh, so Gregory said, hey, I need you two church leaders to go up there. And they got half, we got not even halfway there, and they turn around and send a letter saying, we want to come back, we don't want to do this. And he said, you're doing it. And so they were forced to go, <laughs> they were forced to go and make converts and eventually established around the year 600 the church in England. So, um, then we have these four guys that we're not going to talk about, but in each century, the last line, each century there were church fathers. The 100s we had Polycarp, the 200s we had Tertullian, the 300s we had Ambrose and a bunch of other guys. Um, and in, also in the 300s we had uh, Athanasius. And then I, I listed a bunch of 400s guys up above. And all those guys, those four listed and many others, the big thing they did was they refuted heresies. Don't turn the page yet. <laughs> now, looking at page three and all the things that we filled in, do you notice anything? This is the big takeaway from this page. What's the most common thing these important church fathers did? Refuted heresies. They refuted heresies. Now, before you turn the page, let me just ask you this. Which do you think is more important and more significant, sending missionaries or refuting heresies? Just give me a... Give me a a one if you think it's uh, sending missionaries, and a two if you think it's refuting heresies. Okay. All right. We got we got about a 60-40 split. Okay. Well, let's look at the next page. Figure out from that what I think. Was coming back when he was uh, I mean, it was, it changed so much over the centuries. I mean, the year 600, think how much it changed in a thousand years by the time the pilgrims came. The Church of England at the time of the pilgrims was a thousand years removed from this church that was started. So, I don't, I really can't answer that with any kind of um. The verse, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Without the truth, we have Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, Donna. Thank you. Okay, so before we uh, move on on this page, let's do the little true or false quiz. Now, I want you to answer it silently and write down a T or an F in these blanks. Okay, and then we'll talk about them at the end. Okay, so the first one is, is it good to teach correct doctrine or truth? Don't, don't answer it out loud, just put a T or an F if you think that statement is true or false. Next one, number two, on the same line, is it good to debate correct doctrine or truth? True or false, what do you think? Um... Number three, uh, knowing the truth is more important than prayer. True or false? Don't, don't answer out loud. Being godly and loving is more important than believing correct doctrine. True or false? Just, just make your best guess on all of these. You are not, you're not signing your name to these statements. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, it doesn't do any good to debate doctrine, true or false. 
Okay, now, from the previous page, the missionaries versus refuting heresies, it's kind of a trick question, because the truth is, who can say which is more important? They're both very important. Which would you rather lose, your heart or your brain? Well, I want them both, okay? <laughs> I don't want to live without either. I couldn't live without either. Okay. You don't want the missionary teaching both. Right. Well, oh, I, yeah, I know, oh, yeah. Yeah, I want my brain just as much as I want my heart. I'm not saying one's not important. I'm saying they're both super important. Okay, so it's good to teach correct doctrine. What do I, true or false? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you think? Okay, that one was obvious. If you got that wrong, well, see me after class. You get detention. Okay. Yeah, the first one's true. Okay, the second one. Is it good to debate uh, correct doctrine? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you think? We've got some thumbs up and thumbs down. Some... Is it good to debate it? It's correct. No, it's... no I mean to, to sit down and debate. Two people oh, oh, debating over doctrine. If, it, if it's sound doctrine, should you debate that? I had a debate yesterday with somebody on the phone. I guess it's then I apologized true. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because it got a little heated. <laughs> so. Okay. So, um, um, it is good. I'm sorry for those who said, thought it's not good. It is good. It's, it's important. Even if you hurt someone's feelings, doctrine must be defended. I know, I know, but that's not what I meant. I mean, is, no, is debating it... You should defend the truth, yes. Is debating it good. Yeah. And it's not pleasant. I'm going to write you know, that down because we don't like to do that. I know. I, it's, but here's the thing. Um, if I, like, I had a friend. I worked with, with this person, and uh, she said, you know, um, I'm a... Uh, a Christian and I really love the Bible and I study it and um, and because you know I believe that Jesus paid for my sins I'm gonna go to heaven and I said awesome and she said but someone who's really strong in their Hindu faith they're going to heaven too and I said well um, You're speaking to the wrong person. I said, well, you know, what about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And she said, well, that's from John. John was always making big, sweeping statements, but the synoptics didn't say that. The first three Gospels didn't say anything like that. <clears throat> and at the time, I was like, um... I didn't know what to say. Now, fool me once. <laughs> you know that saying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would know what to say now if someone said that. But um, I'll just tell you in case anyone ever says it to you. Um, Matthew doesn't say there's many paths to God. Matthew says there's two paths. One leads to destruction and one leads to life. There's not many paths. There's only two. And you're on one or the other. Right? The broad path or the narrow path. So, um, <clears throat> but anyway, I didn't think of that at the time, and uh, so I walked away from that. Now, what if, though, what if she had said, um, she had said, well, you know, Hindus are going to heaven too. And I had thought, that's not true, but I have to work with her for eight hours a day <laughs> for, I mean, I, for, from now on. So, I mean, we're like working together here. You carry that, I'll carry this. We were, uh, and we're doing a job together. Anyway, <clears throat> and I thought, man, if we get into this, polit this religious debate, it's going to be messy. I might offend her. I could start making excuses like, I actually, by debating, I might drive her away from Christianity. Or I might say something wrong. So I better just not say anything. If I had said that, which, by the way, I've done that in the past, uh, much to my shame, but 
then on Judgment Day, I don't know how that's going to work exactly, if we're all going to watch each person's judgment or if it's private with God. I don't know. But let's assume that there's possible communication. While you're being judged by God, you can stop and turn to somebody you knew. And I don't know if that's true. But just imagine that it is for a moment. And she's being condemned for not putting her full faith in Jesus. And she turns to me and says, I said this to you that day, and you knew the truth. Why didn't you say something? And I said, well, I would have been uncomfortable. Sorry. Can you imagine, like, the weight? We're like, well, this, this person's going to hell and doesn't know. But I don't want to be awkward with them. <clears throat> so, let me just say, I did my best to debate that point in a friendly way. And it was fine. She didn't care. She won the debate. <laughs> she won the debate of that day. But at least I quoted one verse. I honestly, I mean, I was, this was a long time ago. I did the best I could in the moment. So at least I don't have to feel shame and guilt. About 20 years ago, a professor who was an atheist at KU, Kansas City University, invited our pastor to a debate. Mm -hmm. And we, it was the, we were in the basketball um, court thing, stadium, and it was packed. And so our pastor said, the thing I want you to do most is as you're leaving, listen to the comments. And we were amazed. We took a bus up from, from Kansas City. And it was things like, I never thought of that. You know, he might have <clears> a good <throat> point. And so I think it's good to debate. Yeah, it's good. Now, it's very important in debating to keep hold of your temper and things like that. Um, that's all about how you debate. <clears throat> Either way, it's very important. Okay, because doctrine is... it's. If people compromise the gospel, then there are people who think they're believing in Jesus and are not. So that is very, very important. Okay, so. He did, he did. And the, the professor just walked away. He said, you know, <clears throat> I, I don't want to do this anymore. Okay, so um, it's good to teach correct doctrine and truth, it's good to debate it, knowing the truth which is greater prayer, I, I don't know. Uh, in fact, that question is the question that Augustine wrote about, like, I, I need your help, God, so that I can come to you and get to know you, but like, first I need to know you in order to even pray to you, because if I don't know who you are, I might be praying to somebody else. So which, how do I do this? Okay, We're, we'll, if we have time, we'll read some of that. It's praying to who? Right. I have friends who pray to their ancestors. Sure. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I know. It's super important, but... That's a rabbit trip. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, it's just important. And we might get to that if we have time. But um, you, you can't... It's, again, it's, it's a brain versus heart thing. You have to have them both. You can't say one. Um, being good and loving, believing, truck talking. Again, that was a trick question, too. You have to have them both. Now, does it do any good to debate doctrine? Yes, it does. I mean, of course you want to do it the right way. But remember, there are people who say that. I've heard pastors, godly pastors who devoted their lives to the service of Christ, who've told me, never debate. It doesn't do any good to debate. It's immature. It's harmful. It just puffs up your ego. It's terrible. Lots of people say that. And I get it because it can do all those things. But, and, and to some people, when they hear the word debate, they think it means like a shouting match. But you must stand up for the truth. If you're in a little group around the water cooler and someone says, and you say something about the Bible, and they're like, yeah, that's great for you, but you know, that might not be true for other people. 
if at all possible, don't let that slide. Say, well, if it's true, it's true, and if it's false, it's false. But it's not true for one person and not for another. Right? Two plus two equals four for me and for you. We can't come up with different answers to what's true. Yeah, anyway, something. Maybe not that exactly, but you, you can't just let that slide because people are being deceived. So, there's, and the, okay. So, okay, so all those church fathers that I said there, they were did, um, refuting heresy. That is super important because I have a list of heresies here that we're going to go over. Uh, most of these, until the very end of the page, were what the early church was combating. The very first heresy that the church faced was legalism. Right? Can anyone think of the name that the New Testament uses for that typically? The big, the big legalistic heresy that was going around in the early church that Paul was writing about and all these guys were writing about. Judaism. Yeah, the Judaizers were teaching um, salvation through Jesus plus works. Right? Or sometimes, yes, you got to believe that Jesus paid for your sins. You also need the law. Or, and you also need circumcision. Or you also need something. Jesus plus anything is a false gospel. And <clears throat> Paul's first book, Galatians, is all about that. It's not, it's not, you're falling away to another gospel, which is no gospel at all, really. It's a false gospel. Um, and that was all about circumcision and that sort of thing. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. <clears throat> the primary thing. Okay, so that was going on in the first century. Now, is that still going on now? Yes. 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 It, that heresy has cropped up in every generation because it's easier to believe in legalism than it is to believe that Jesus saved us purely by grace. You did nothing. You are 0% better than the person who goes to hell. I, okay. So, let's just talk about a few facts about it. Um, often there is a superior mentality in a legalistic faith. And I hear it in our church and in class. Those terrible people, those terrible people who are promoting these terrible sins. And I say, yes, but why do you say it with such a superior, condescending attitude? Because you're not any better. Well, I've been going to church my whole life, and I've been sharing the gospel, still 0% better. So, that's just a, a fact. And the, the, the legalism of the first century and of every century ever since, there was, not always, but there was often that superior mentality. Okay, often it's harsh. Often it's strict. And often it's a focus on the outward. Think about circumcision. You can't just have faith inside you. You have to have an outward show of who you're committed to, even if it's painful. Uh, often, often there's a there's a focus. I met someone who said, "You can't just get to heaven by faith." I've seen so many people who are like, "I believe in Jesus," and then they live however they want. Salvation is by works. So this person was coming out of a church of people who were going the opposite extreme, who were just saying, yeah, I believe in Jesus, so I'm going to heaven. Now I can live however I want, and it doesn't matter. So she was reacting and saying, no, salvation is by works. And she meant it passionately. She may have been a believer and confused. I don't know. But um, the point is, there's a focus on the outward. And so people think, you know, i got to earn my way to heaven. Okay. Um, one last fact about them. Often they are driven by will. 
and often they're driven by guilt. The ones who are driven by guilt and constantly failing, whatever their, their mind or their teacher is teaching them, this is how you get to heaven by doing all these things, those are the ones who sometimes don't have that superior mentality because they're weighted down with guilt. The ones who are able to keep up all their boxes they're supposed to check, those are the ones that tend to be um, superior. Okay, so the blank, the long line, that's not a dividing line, that's a line. You can write Judaizers. You can write SDA, Seventh-day Adventists. That's not their only heresy. They, Seventh-day Adventists are a mix of two heresies, two ancient heresies. Um, and then even some Baptists. They say they believe in salvation by faith alone, but they actually don't. And if you listen to their sermons, you certainly get the vibe that you got to do all these things to get to heaven. Okay. So, um, those are some uh, groups that are based on those heresies. Remember, these ancient heresies that people were debating a thousand years ago, they're super relevant for today because they keep coming up in new forms. Okay, the next one, uh, uh, docetism, is basically just Jesus didn't have a human body. That was a heresy in the first century. Uh, J John in 1 John was combating an early form of that heresy. That heresy was around for a long time. Uh, in 1 John 4, 2, he says, if you, those who teach that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, um, they're, they're antichrists if they teach that. Not the antichrist. But anyway, um, so John was combating that, and they later joined and mixed with Gnosticism, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, any questions about the first two heresies? It's been a long time on legalism because I grew up in that, and so... Um, What's the name of the religion that only believes 144,000? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yes, and, um, and some other things. We're going to talk, cover them in a moment. Um, okay, so um, the Ebionites, I'm not sure how to say that. Um, they were around for the first four centuries of Christianity. And they said Jesus wasn't God, and they retained a lot of Judaism, and they rejected Paul because they said, Paul said Jesus is more important than the Mosaic Law. No way. Today they say he's a prophet. Well, I don't know if that specific group is around. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, there are people who say that, certainly. Okay. Um, now this one, this is a huge one. Uh, Arianism. Jesus, God the Son, was begotten. He had a beginning. This was a huge debate in the church. You, can anyone guess a verse that they might have used to support that, that Jesus had a beginning? God said, this is my begotten Son, in whom I am well Yeah. This is my only begotten Son. Um, you know, John 3.16, right? Um, uh, says, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten, so He was begotten, right? Um, well, if you read a dynamic equivalent, like the NIV, it helps you understand what that means. It says, he gave his one and only. And the O and one and the O and only are capitalized. He gave his one and only son. You can see how somebody with, who only has one child would say, this is my only begotten son. That was a phrase people used, my only child. If you have ten and you lose one, that's very sad. But if you only have one, it's more special to you. So that phrase, only begotten, came to mean one and only. 
And that's the phrase that John used. So, um, <clears throat> so Jesus was not begotten, but this guy Arian taught that. And it's a huge debate and it's still around today. Now, the big, one of the big groups that still teaches that is Jehovah's Witnesses. They also do emphasize works and things like that. But in my only debate with Jehovah's Witnesses on the New Jersey beach, I happened, <laughs> and I was like 13, I happened to get in a debate with a whole family of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, you know, they were saying that. They said, Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't equal with God the Father. He was the Son. Okay. We don't have time to uh, get into it, but... Um, so that's, that's been coming up again and again. Okay, uh, next is Gnosticism. This one is a little tricky, but we talked about it last week, so hopefully um, we don't have to cover it too much. Um, let's see. Donna, could you read my definition there of Gnosticism? Yeah, okay, so the knowledge often comes from, and these groups often have, other writings or mystical experience or inner light. They're the key to spiritual truth. Now, you take that Gnosticism and you mix it with legalism and you get Seventh-day Adventist. They, there is this higher knowledge, and it only comes through the writings of Ellen G. White. And, and they will say, they will say, no, 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 no. She's a commentator. You, got, you have a commentator, John MacArthur, or whoever. She's just a commentator. Now, she has a lot of commentaries on Scripture, and, um, and if, but if she ever contradicts, she even says, if I ever contradict Scripture, go with Scripture over me. <clears throat> but she gives a lens through which to interpret Scripture. And through that lens, you come up with a false gospel. So as much as they say Scripture is greater than the writings of Ellen G. White, it's actually not true. You read Scripture through her lens, and you come up with a false gospel. It's very insidious, uh, very sneaky. <clears throat> it doesn't mean God doesn't love people who are part of that. It doesn't mean they can't get saved, and they do. They do get saved out of that. Okay, also, Gnosticism. That, that uh, heresy kept coming up again and again, and we see it today in other movements, too. In Mormonism, even. In Christian science. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. Um, in the New Age movement. Uh, the problem with Gnosticism and the problem with the New Age movement is that it's constantly changing and morphing. And so you can never pin down exactly what it is. <clears throat> but you can see the appeal to having the secret hidden knowledge. Like, 25% of all movies are based on that, like, oh, I found the truth, right? I uncovered the mystery. We love that. I figured it out. You know, everybody else thinks this, but, right, we love that. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, anyway, okay, Pelagianism. Oh, Diane hates this one. Why do you hate this one? Because it's not true. We are basically. I hate oh. people say that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Basically. Again, you see it. I'm sorry I didn't give a, a time period for this guy's writings, but um, you see it come up again and again and again. Okay, so basically, um, <clears throat> let's see, Bev, could you read the definition of that? Okay, so um, Diane says she's met people who say this. Oh, yeah. 
Any, anyone know any groups that believe this? Um, uh, oh, oh, I think it has. But um, there are some Pentecostal groups who believe this. Um, I'm not going to get into others, um, but uh, there's a lot. And you'll hear people say it. Okay. Um, Yeah, some Pentecostal groups. Not all, but some. Okay. Uh, The last big one from a long time ago. And I don't know how to say it. Socinianism. But um, let's see. Um, Lynn, could you read the depth bullet points about this uh, heresy? Okay, hold on. Uh, that is a type. That is a that is a non a typo. Um, they believe that um, Adam and Eve would have died whether they ate from the tree or not. Okay, and I, I don't know why that's a big deal to them, but it is. Um, but they did reject the doctrine of original sin. In other words, um, like Pelagianism, uh, we don't inherit a sin from our parents. We're not born sinners. Um, so that's what it means by directed, uh, rejected the doctrine of original sin. It means you're not born with a sin nature. Okay, keep going. Then. They rejected the um, uh, propitiatory view of atonement. Okay, so what does propitiatory mean? It's a big word. It's not important that you know what that word means. Um <clears throat> Well, yeah, that God, Jesus died in your place is substitutionary, but propitiatory is that Jesus satisfied the wrath. And like, like, it's not a happy thought to think that when you're born, God stands over against you in wrath. But he does, because you were born in rebellion to him. But Jesus solves that. So that the Father doesn't need to have wrath at you, because his wrath is satisfied in the atoning sacrifice of his son. Um, okay, so they, they reject that. <clears throat> One more. And they elevate free will over God's sovereignty. Okay, so some groups that <clears throat> believe that is Unitarians <clears throat> that you'll see today. Really, honestly, um, the majority of theological liberals, well, as a term, not just someone who's a little bit liberal in their theology, but that term, <clears throat> that's the stuff they believe. And honestly, most of the old mainline denominations, that's why the denominations in America split and splintered, because they started teaching this stuff more and more blatantly, and everyone who was a genuine believer got out. <clears throat> And they taught, you can see why in the 15 and 1600s this was popular because of the Enlightenment and all that, the human reason is a higher authority than Scripture. So, you know, if human reason finds out that, you know, I don't know, evolution or anything, then that trumps Scripture. <clears throat> okay. Only two more, but any questions about any of those? We covered just, I don't know, five of them just now. It's not important you remember the details. It's important that you remember that there are people out there teaching heresies, and somebody needs to step up and say, that's not true. That's not the gospel. Yeah, yeah. So what happened is um, <clears throat> when this, the first issue that came up was um, the infallibility of Scripture. Um, and it was very sneaky the way they said it. They said, the Bible is inerrant, has no errors, but it's not infallible. 
so is, does it have errors? It doesn't have errors, or it could not have errors, right? I could write something that's inerrant. I could write 2 plus 2 is 4. No errors in that. But it's not infallible because I can make mistakes. So it's very sneaky. You can see how people are like, whatever, inerrant, infallible. It means the same thing to me, sure. My pastor says that I'll believe it, right? And from that foothold, then it was, now when we say inerrant, what we mean is inerrant in matters of faith. The Bible's not a history book. The Bible's not a science book. The Bible's about faith. And you can see how people could be like, okay, yeah, sure. It's still, they're still teaching that Jesus is the only way to heaven, and so he died on the cross for my sins. So, <clears throat> And so little by little they eroded that the Bible was God's word, infa infallible, unable to have mistakes, God's word. And so as they eroded that, more and more people who were like, wait a minute. No, the Bible has no errors. The Bible is God's word. Those people were leaving the denominations. And <clears throat> over the course of the 1900s, most of the denominations, the only people who were left were the people who were like, who cares? As long as you love people. That's basically what the Bible says. I never read it, but it's basically what the Bible is about, loving people. So... And so most of the denominations, I, I can't list them all that are like that, um, but, um, you know, that, yeah. I don't know enough about it, but uh, you could read all about it. You can read The Great Evangelical Disaster by, um, what's that guy's name? Francis Schaeffer, and learn all about that. And then there's lots of other books. Um... And the, okay, so one last thing about them is the, the oh, I just said that. Okay, modernism, when people say modernism, you might see that. That basically reduces Christianity to a moral code. And one last thing is open theology, which is a subset, one kind of finite godism. Finite, God is finite, He's not, not infinite and all powerful, God is limited. So lots of people say God is limited. Uh, open theology is one of the ways they get there. And they have all these complicated reasons for it. Like, um, can God make a square circle? And you're like, uh, I guess not. See, God's limited, right? <laughs> anyway, it's much more smart than that. And <laughs> That makes them sound stupid. They're not stupid. But, um, okay. But the big one that I want to talk about is because at the very first Q&A at Evans Prairie, those of you who remember this, long time, long time ago we had a Q&A at Evans Prairie, and it, the topic was suffering. Don't ask me why I chose that for the opening one. Uh, but I met someone there who said, I read this book by this guy, Harold Kushner. I didn't realize like how famous. It was a mega bestseller. And it was called, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Okay? And he was a rabbi, and he used a lot of scripture. But basically, um, it boiled down to these two points. Uh, Sue, could you read those two points? Okay, pause. That sounds good. Like nobody would be like, whoa, whoa, that's not good. Everyone, some people would be like, most people would be like, okay, I don't know how to respond to it, what caused it. I don't know which is more important, so if this guy says that, I can accept that. But then you find out this is his backing for it. You're right. This guy's wrong. These are all these things on this sheet. These are all wrong. So, um, you think, well, the book of Job is all about that, right? 
the whole ending of Job is God saying, look how powerful I am. Right? I'm controlling the constellations and the weather and the molecules and everything. Right? This guy Kushner says, no, no, no. What God is saying is like, look how much I have to do. I have to control the tides and the constellations and all this stuff. I can't worry about every single person. I wish I could, but I just can't. I'm running the whole universe here. It's not an easy job. It's an impossible job. Right, right, yeah. So he takes the whole point of God's speeches at the end of Job and turns them upside down. Um, and so I, I tried to explain to this lady because she had gone through a terrible tragedy. And, she, and she, I, she said, that gives me comfort to know that God loves me, but he just couldn't prevent that thing from happening. That's hard. Um, to, 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 when someone finds comfort in something to say, well really wrong and terrible. Um, so anyway, um, I guess perhaps she initially was angry with God because she thought God could have stopped it from happening. But then when she found out that he couldn't, then she was able to forgive God and know he was doing his best. So I tried to explain to her from, from Scripture that the idea that God is not all powerful is a, a terrible heresy. And, and really, at the root of it, is raising your fist at God. Um, I did not win that debate. I did not convince her. But I, I tried my best, gently to show her the truth, and who knows? I don't remember her name, so I can never find out what happened with that. Okay, any questions about any of those damning heresies? Damning. Yeah, because there are false gospels. Oh, yes, okay, so, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, There's no good people. So the, your answer to that would be, well, there are no good people. The only problem with that um, is that um, there are innocent people. Not, well, no, I mean, you know, if you're asleep and someone breaks into your house and kills you, you were the victim. In that situation, you were the innocent one. It doesn't mean you never sinned, but it means in that thing you were the innocent one. It's not like, well, it's my own fault. I shouldn't have been, you know, trying to jump off of a moving train. Right? Yeah, generally speaking, I'm, I'm talking about Christians, though, that God is sovereign over our lives. He's sovereign, isn't uh, he? Oh, yeah. God is absolutely, and utterly sovereign. Things, Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so the big um, takeaway from Job, one of the major takeaways, is that you, you may not demand an answer for why some things happen to you. You, may ask, you. you are allowed, God will allow you to ask him, God, why did this thing have to happen to me? That's not a sin. But it is a sin to demand that he answer you. And Job, you see him cross that line and back up. That, that he's questioning, 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 and he'll cross the line and demand and back up. Because he really wants to demand, because he, he was innocent. Um, and so God shows up and says, you don't get to, 
I run this universe, not you. You don't get to demand it. Don't forget, everything that happened to Job was not by God, it was by Satan. Exactly. Well, well, God permitted it. Yeah. But not us. Even God himself in Job says that not only did I permit Satan to do that, thereby I did it. Because God is sovereign even over the actions of Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he says it himself. He says, you, Satan, incited me against him. Now, the way he carried that out was allowing Satan certain powers. So, um, so yes. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's really not important. We're going to just take... We're not going to read this whole thing. We're just going to take a, a few minutes and look at the opening of one of Augustine's books. He's one of these writers, and you think, man... He was writing in the year 400 A.D. You know, this guy didn't even know what a car was. Okay? You think, this guy could have very little to say that would be of use to me. Okay, well, let's just see. Let's at least read the first paragraph. Um, um, Bev, could you read that first paragraph? Yeah, keep going a little bit more. Say, say to my soul, I am the one who saves you. Say it that I may hear it. The ears of my heart wait to hear you. Open them and say to my soul, I am the one who saves you. I will run to fear, run to clasp you to myself. Do not hide your face from me. Let me see your face, even if I die. At least I die longing to see it. The house of my soul is small, too small for you to enter. Enlarge it. Okay. Okay, um, so, yeah, I'm sure some of that, you're like, what is he saying? Um, and that's fine, but you can take this one line at a time and think about what he's saying, and it's very powerful. Um, who will help me find rest in you? That's the first line. When you are struggling in your Christian walk, and you want to be closer to God than you are, and you struggle with sins, and you struggle with all these things, there is a part of you that longs to just find rest in God and just know that He has forgiven everything, even the sins that you don't have victory over yet, the sins that you know. I mean, I'm, say, let's say you have a sin, and you're like, man, I am failing at this sin like once a week. I'm messing up, sometimes more than once a week. And this has been going on for years, and I've been praying and asking God, help me get victory over this sin. You want to just find rest in God and know it's forgiven. And someday, hopefully sooner rather than later, but eventually, no matter what, I will have victory over this. I will be free from this. Okay, but Augustine is wrestling with this. This book is called The Confessions. And he confesses many sins for the whole world, for the last 16 centuries of people to read. Um, who will help me open my heart for you to fill it with delight? Don't raise your hand, but just in your mind, raise your hand if you actually feel delight in God, in being with Him, in knowing Him, don't, don't actually raise your hand, but sometimes we get the idea that Christianity is about only serving Him. 
and obeying Him. And those things are super important. Serving God, obeying God, fearing God, respecting God, worshiping God, but also delighting in God. If you have no delight, something is wrong with your walk. And you need to talk to Him about it. It starts with asking God. If that's true, you say, God, you know, I don't really enjoy being with you and talking to you and worshiping you. I enjoy the tune of the songs, but I don't actually enjoy saying those things about you, so help me. I want that. Augustine is saying, I need someone to help me open my heart to God so that he can fill it with delight. And much more. Any questions about Augustine? Probably the single most influential church father.